ASRock N100 DC ITX. You guys have been begging me to make a video about this board, and it took me months to finally deliver. Why? Well, because there isn't really much to say about it. It's a great board for a low power small form factor home server. It comes with a passively cooled 4 core CPU, which is rated for a TDP of 6 watts. It can be powered from a single 19 volt power brick. It draws less than 6 watts at idle. It has both an M.2 slot and an open ended PCIe X2 slot. It features a powerful iGPU that supports AV1 decoding, and you can actually buy it locally, at least here in Europe. Which means that you won't have to import it from AliExpress, like some other low power motherboards. So that's it, right? Video over. Well, not quite. Thing is, the ASRock N100 DC ITX has one big weakness, which makes it a no-go for a DIY NAS. It can only take two hard drives. That's right, not only does this board have two SATA ports, it also doesn't offer any way to power your drives, apart from this wimpy GST connector and a power cable made for, once again, two drives. And it's so frustrating because there isn't really any other board out there that is mini TX, has a PCIe X2 slot for a 10 gig networking card, and supports lower C states. Man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break my monitor, I swear! But fret not, because today, we're gonna be fixing that little problem and turning the N100 DCI TX into the perfect DIY NAS board that it was always meant to be. I'm also gonna be putting together a little build using this motherboard and the John's Bowen 2 case, as well as doing some benchmarks and measuring the total power consumption. I'm very excited about this low power build, so let's put it together, right after a word from our sponsor, Notion. Now, Notion is the kind of software product that doesn't need an introduction. In fact, everything you hear right now was first written in Notion. I'm using Notion to manage pretty much every aspect of my channel, budgeting, project management, scripting, and finances. And recently, Notion's launched a new feature called Q&A. It's your personal AI-powered assistant, which provides an intelligent search functionality throughout everything you've ever written in Notion. Now, I've benchmarked a few CPUs in this channel, and every time I want to see how a certain CPU performed, I either have to go to my own YouTube channel and scrub through the respective video, or go to the video script and look for the information there. With Notion Q&A, I can simply ask, how do the CPUs that I've tested so far perform when it comes to Dune transcoding? As you can see, it's gonna look through all of my scripts and find the benchmark results for all the CPUs, including the N100. Whoops, spoilers. <laughs> but Notion Q&A is actually only a small part of Notion AI, which includes tons of helpful features that make writing and editing text in Notion a breeze. Since I use teleprompter in my videos, I try to write things in a more conversational tone. Using Notion AI, I can rewrite entire blocks of text in a different tone, like casual, professional, or straightforward. I can also use Notion AI to check things like spelling and grammar, and simplify some more cumbersome sentences, which, as someone who's not a native English speaker, can really come in handy. As an added bonus, unlike generative AI tools like ChatGPT, Notion does not use your data to train their AI models without your consent. You can get started with Notion for free and unlock all the AI features for just $10 a month. Notion Q&A is still in beta at the time of making this video, and if you're interested in trying it out, check out the link in the description. So huge thanks to Notion for sponsoring today's video, and now, let's get back to the N100. So what exactly do I mean when I say that this motherboard can only take two drives? Is it because it only has two SATA ports? No. This one is actually a pretty easy fix. The N100 DC ITX features an M.2 slot, so you can simply buy this 6 port AS Media card for less than 20 bucks, plug it into the motherboard, and this will give you 8 SATA ports in total. And unlike the JMB585, which is installed on the NAS centric N100 boards from Topton and CWWK, the ASM1166 supports PCIe power management, so it won't give you any issues with C states. Awesome, so what about the SATA power? Well, that part is a bit trickier. Unlike its bigger brother, the N100M, the N100 DCI-TX doesn't have a 24-pin ATX connector, so you can't power it with a standard ATX power supply. Instead, you're supposed to use a 19-volt laptop power brick, and when it comes to powering your drives, the N100 DCI-TX comes with a 4-pin GST power connector, as well as this adapter cable for two SATA drives. Please ignore the fact that there's actually no connector at the end of that cable. <laughs> Now if you just want to use two hard drives with the board, or maybe don't want to use any spinning rust whatsoever, this is not that big of a deal. But what if you need more drives? 
Well, right now you're probably thinking, why not just take the stock SATA adapter and solder more SATA ports onto it? I mean, there are SATA splitters out there with as much as 8 SATA connectors. And even though that might work, I really wouldn't recommend it. The 4-pin power connector on the N100DC is only rated for 2 amps per pin, and a typical 7200 RPM hard drive can pull as much as 2.5 amps on the 12 volt rail when spinning up, which means that if you have, say, 4 hard drives, those will pull around 10 amps, all from a connector that's rated for 2. Now I don't know about you, but even though the simultaneous spin-up thing only happens in startup, I still wouldn't want to risk it in the long run, especially for a system that's supposed to run 24-7. The only case in which I would recommend this solution is if you're building an SSD only NAS, since SSDs need way less power than hard drives. That being said, let's talk about the solution that would let us use this board with as many hard drives as we want, that is, powering the board with a standard ATX power supply. Now at first, I almost scrapped the idea. The Azurox website says that you need a 19 volt power supply to power the board, and a standard computer power supply can only provide 12, 5, and 3.3 volts. So there's no way we can power this board with a standard ATX power supply, short of using a voltage converter. Or at least that's what I thought, until I read the N100 DC ATX review from Igor's lab. As it turns out, despite what Azrak says, this motherboard will happily take anything between 12 and 20 volts, which makes our task way easier. Armed with that information, we can make a custom power supply cable, using a 4-pin CPU power extension cable and a DC jack to terminal block adapter. I'm gonna cut the male part of the 4-pin ATX cable, strip the wires, and feed them into the terminals on the 12 volt jack. And there we go, cable done. Finally, in order for a power supply to actually turn on without a signal from the motherboard, we can use a thick piece of wire to jump the pins on the ATX connector. That way, the power supply is going to turn on as soon as we plug the system to the wall. If you want to be fancy or don't have a thick wire at home, you can also buy an ATX jumper, like this one. So here's a test setup that I built, with a John's Bowen 2, a Silent Storm Sharkoon SFX power supply, an M.2 SATA controller, a 2.5 inch boot drive, and 5 3.5 inch hard drives. As you can see, the system is unplugged from the wall now, but once we plug it in, we should hear a hard drive spin up. And once we press the power button on the case, the motherboard also springs into life. To avoid having to press the button every time, we can go into the BIOS and set the motherboard to automatically power on when plugged into the wall. Since we're using a DC jack with block terminals, we can also use these convenient Wi-Fi antenna holes to pass the cables from the inside of the case to the outside. That's not my idea, by the way. I stole it from Minger's lab. And voila, an N100 DC ITX build with 5 hard drives, and enough room to add 2 SATA SSDs down the line. So now that we've fixed the biggest issue that I've had with the N100 DC ITX, let's talk about the build. This machine is actually going to be running at my parents' house, and serve as an offsite backup for my YouTube footage. It's also going to run SyncThing and PhotoPrism, and basically pull all the new photos from my parents' smartphones. I've already made a video about their current quote-unquote NAS, and some of you guys suggested that I use it for offsite backups. And honestly, I thought that the idea was genius, and kinda just decided to do it. I'm working on a separate video for this build, in which I'm going to go over the components, set up things like remote control, peer-to-peer -peer VPN, Docker, and so on. So make sure to subscribe if you don't want to miss it. For now though, let's talk about the power consumption. Now, in order to test this board's power consumption, I decided to swap from the SFX power supply to a Pico PCU. Most of the measurements on this channel were made either with a Pico PCU or a Corsair RM550X, so in order to be able to compare this board to other ones that I've tested so far on this channel, I'm going to be plugging into a Pico PCU. With a 16GB stick of RAM and a SATA SSD, this board draws 67 watts from the wall at idle, and will only go down to C3. After some trial and error, I found that the culprit was the built-in real technic, so I forced the L1 ASPM for the NIC with this terminal command which brought the power consumption to 5.2 watts and allowed the system to go to C8. I also saw no difference between plugging this board directly into the 12V adapter and powering it with our custom 12V to DC jack adapter. The power consumption stayed the same. After plugging in the SATA controller, as well as our 5 hard drives and putting them to sleep, the power consumption goes up to just 10.9 watts, which is about what you should expect from this board 
if you're going to be using it as a DIY NAS. That's pretty impressive. Now, one of the reasons why I prefer the N100 DCI-TX to other Mini-ATX N100 boards is the PCIe X4 slot, which is actually only wired for X2. Still, this should be more than enough for a 10 gig SFP Plus card. Personally, I can recommend the Trendnet TEG 10 GEC SFP card. It's based on a relatively new PowerFission Aquantia AQC100 NIC and supports PCIe power management. There are other cards based on the AQC100 series chips though, and some may be cheaper or easier to get where you live, so do your research. After plugging in the networking card and letting the drive sleep, we see total power consumption from the wall of 12.4 watts. That's with 16 gigs of RAM, one SAT SSD, five hard drives in the spin down mode, and a 10 gig networking card. Not bad at all. And in case you're wondering, disabling the integrated real technic has pretty much no effect on the overall power consumption. One weird thing I noticed with the 10 gig networking card though is that if I ran the iPerf 3 in a single connection mode, I couldn't get anywhere near 10 gigabits. However, when running it with 5 connections in parallel, I was able to get the full 10 gigabit speeds, even when testing in both directions. At first I thought that the card was bottlenecked by the CPU, but looking at HTOP, the N100 processor only gets to around 33% load when testing the network speed. I also tried playing with jumbo frames and TCP windows to pretty much no avail. So if there are any networking experts out there who know what the hell is going on here, please leave a comment below. One more thing I wanted to test on this board is the power consumption when running VMs. In my last video, I used this board to run virtual machines with Windows XP, Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows 10, and Windows 11, all at the same time. And while I was at it, I measured the power consumption while running the VMs. During the installation, the entire system, without the hard drives and the networking card, was pulling around 18 watts of power. That's with all versions of Windows being automatically installed at the same time. But once the installation was finished and all the VMs settled down, the power consumption went down to around 10 to 12 watts. Remember, that's with 5 Windows VMs running at the same time. So here's what the final power consumption numbers look like. 5.2 watts at C6 with nothing plugged in but a SATA SSD and a 16 gig stick of RAM, 12 watts at C2 with 5 Windows VMs running at the same time, 10.9 watts at C6 with an external SATA controller and 5 hard drives in the spin down mode without the VMs and 12.4 watts at C6 with all of the above except for VMs plus a 10 gig SFP plus networking card. Honestly, this might be my most power efficient NAS build to date. And since the N100 CPU also has a TDP of 6 watts, the average power draw including both idle and resource intensive workloads is probably going to be pretty low as well. Now that we've talked about the power consumption, let's move on to hardware video transcoding. Now despite its modest CPU performance, the N100 comes with a pretty powerful iGPU. It supports QuickSync and you should have no issues using it in Plex and Jellyfin. As an added bonus, it also supports AV1 decoding, which we're going to take a look at later on in the video. But first, let's take a look at our usual hardware transcoding benchmarks. In the 1080p H264 test, the N100 scored 125 FPS. In the 4K H264 test, we see 35 FPS. In the 1080p HAVC test, the N100 scores 54 FPS. In the 4K 10-bit HAVC test, we see a figure of 14 FPS. And here's what it looks like compared to some other GPUs that I've tested so far. As you can see, it's pretty close to the Intel HD 630, except for the H265 1080p test, where the N100 performs even worse than the Intel HD 530. At the same time, let's not forget that it's a 6 watt CPU, unlike the Skylake and Kaby Lake chips which could stretch their legs a bit further. As for my traditional Dune test, the N100 manages to transcode the movie at 4080fps in this particular scene. And once again, here's how that compares to some other CPUs that I've tested. Now, since the N100 supports AV1 decoding, I wanted to see how well it handles AV1 content. Here it is playing back a 4K HDR AV1 copy of Lord of the Rings at around 48fps, which is about the same as the HEVC. Keep in mind though that unlike Intel Arc GPUs, the N100 doesn't support AV1 encoding. So if you're looking for a low power CPU to transcode your entire movie collection to AV1, maybe look elsewhere. 
Now, if you're buying an N100 base motherboard, you're probably not buying it for performance. That being said, it can definitely handle some typical home server loads, like running a couple of VMs, some Docker containers, and doing ZFS operations every now and then. Sure, 5 Windows VMs is probably pushing it, but even then, we're mostly limited by RAM and not the CPU. Performance-wise, the N100 is similar to i3-6100, which is a quad-core Skylake chip with a 51W TDP. Which doesn't seem all that impressive, until you realize that the N100 is a 6W chip, which makes it 8.5 times more efficient than the i3-6100. And compared to the previous generations of Intel's low-power Atom-like chips, like the N5105 and J4125, the N100 is definitely an improvement. I'm still working on a test suit for home server specific tasks, so for now we'll just have to trust Cinebench and Passmark scores. So there you have it guys, we fixed one of N100's biggest issues and built a super compact and power efficient NAS with 10 gig networking and hardware video transcoding. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and as usual I would like to thank my patrons, James Eppington, Alessandro Colori, Carlos Bonilla, David Love, Jubastica, Leaper, Matthew K, Robust Stream of Crypto, Scott Huffman, and everyone else who supports my channel. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.